welcome to today's technique tutorial. My name is Samantha Wiltshire and today we'll be discussing contemporary erasure. So what we mean by contemporary erasure is we're going to explore all of the different ways that contemporary artists today have been pushing the boundaries of how they're able to use their physical erasers, but also how they might be able to use a number of other pieces of equipment or materials um, to also erase or conceal or obscure. So an overview of what we'll be covering today, we'll be taking a look at the equipment for this activity, we'll be covering our lesson objectives, um, we'll be theoretically understanding contemporary erasure, and then we'll have a practice together of smearing, obscuring, lifting and scrubbing to create a really expressive drawing. Um, we're going to be talking about all of the endless possibilities for experimentation, and then we'll be concluding with some references and further activities. The equipment you'll need for the practical activity today is um, any piece of paper is fine. Uh, some charcoal, preferably willow charcoal, because compressed charcoal can be a little bit more difficult to work with when you're a beginner. Um, I'd recommend having both a hard eraser and a kneadable eraser. Um, you can, if you'd like, use a mull stick. And if you're not sure what a mull stick is, I would encourage you to watch our mull stick video. Uh, and you also may like to have some tissues or paper stumps for smudging today. So today our goals are to build some brand new textures and create some new outcomes. Um, We're also working today on developing greater flexibility and problem solving ability in our art making. Um, and particularly uh, erasure is very important because often we use erasure to uh, create highlights. And we know that we need the contrast between the super dark darks and the super bright highlights in order to make something feel three dimensional. So knowing that there's a few different ways that we might be able to lift when we're drawing can really give you a greater ability to um, create that contrast. And we can see an example of how Michael Sims in his work Engulfed has um, created a background of charcoal and has then used the eraser to lift out the three dimension of this person's body. And he's also done some really interesting smudging and obscuring on the face. Um, and we would also hope for you to be able to find opportunities for some further experimentation after today's activity. So we would love for you to um, try some new things in your own time and definitely show your classroom tutor as well if you have a, a bit of a play around. Contemporary erasure includes any means of partially or fully removing, concealing, lifting or hiding. And so um, some examples of this might include scraping off or scratching back, gently lifting pigment to lighten or soften with an eraser, tissue or cloth, covering something with layers of another medium or material, wiping off or smearing back, um, tearing or cutting, uh, and many more. There could be so many other options that we could add to this list. Um, really, the possibilities are endless um, in today's art scene. So let's start by taking a look at just one of these techniques we've mentioned, which is scratching back. So a way that we can describe scratching back into another medium professionally in our industry is graffito. Um, so you might like to start yourself a vocabulary list and keep that somewhere in a little diary so that you can remember these terms and techniques as we cover them. Um, and the example we'll be looking at today is uh, Nick Mozakis. He's created this work, Nature, Insects, Plants, Flowers, Corals, the Microscopic Creature Dreams. Uh, and this work is created using black wax crayon, lithogra lithographic crayon, uh, pencil, paper tapes, white gouache, light brown wash, and scraping out on the paper. So he's come into these materials and we can see where he's scratched back, particularly into that crayon and wax in order to reveal these highlights. Um, and this work was a winner of the Dobell Drawing Prize in 2006, which is a, a contemporary drawing prize that you might like to consider one day entering yourself. Um, and it's a great one to take a look at in general. Pop on and, and look at all of the previous winners and see how many of them don't just do drawing in the typical way that we would imagine drawing, but really push the boundaries of their materials. And we've got another case study here um, for concealment or covering in layers as a technique. Uh, and so this is a drawing by uh, the artist Anthony Carhill made 
uh, this year, and it is Conti and Pastel on Paper. So what Carhill has done is he's created this figure drawing, and then he's come and concealed it with a layer on top of this pastel, which kind of creates a bit of like a, a shadow of the person, but it overlaps the person. And so we're kind of thinking about where the boundaries are of this person, or maybe this is where this person has stood before and now they've moved forward and we, we can see um, their previous position. We could interpret this in so many different ways um, because of this layering. And it also means that we see the face as a focal point. And then when we peer a little bit closer, we're seeing more and more of the body through that slightly concealed layer of pastel on top. So it creates a little bit more interest in terms of the technique. Right, so we can also apply techniques of smearing, obscuring, lifting, and scrubbing. Um, and so someone who does a great job of this is Damien Goidich. And we can see here some drawings from life uh, from 2016, where he's been swiping the charcoal, really probably getting quite messy and playing with it. Um, and also lifting with an eraser to reveal some of the highlights in the face. So we're now going to learn how to draw a simple still life and we're going to be using smearing and lifting to obscure as well. And the results should hopefully be similar to what Goidich produces. So the first step that we're going to use is to lightly construct our object. So you might like to screenshot this slide uh, to print and you can follow along with me as I construct this flower. We're not going to be drawing the background today. We're only going to be using this largest flower right in the center. And what we can do is we can begin by enveloping and finding the approximate center. So on your own printout, you might like to also draw the envelope around the shape of your flower. Remembering that enveloping is when we take the external boundaries of the shape and we're going to use nice straight lines to almost dot to dot right around the sides. And you'll notice that I don't dip in where the petals dip in. I go straight across to the next um, point that sticks out the furthest. Uh, and then I've created an axis down the middle and also a curved axis across the center. And the reason for creating that curved axis is to remind me that the shape of this flower is concave. So this flower scoops down like this. And you'll see here on my slide, I've got an example of the difference between concave and convex. So convex, it bubbles out like a contact lens um, or like a hill and concave dips in like a cave or like a bowl or a teacup. And that's how we can remember the difference. Um, and so as we're constructing this today, you can be as accurate or as free and gestural as you would like. It doesn't matter if you don't have um, a great deal of uh, ability in terms of measuring proportion or anything like to that today, because our goal is just to really get a sensation of the subject rather than an exact photocopy. All right, so now we're over here at my drawing station and I've got my printout of my poppy. I'm going to grab my piece of charcoal and I'm going to start with that enveloping process that we talked about just before. So I'm going to, with my charcoal, make a nice dark line. And I'm going to begin joining together the outside most areas of my poppy flower. So if you've never used charcoal before, just be aware that it's going to draw a little bit uh, more dark than you might be used to with a pencil. So you're only going to need to press very, very lightly. And you may like to, before we begin, have a little go just with um, doing a bit of a scribble and getting used to your material. So I'm using nice sweeping diagonal lines. And yours don't have to be as dark as mine. I'm doing mine very dark so that you can see it here on my camera. All right, so now I've got the envelope around the outside extremities of my flower. So I haven't dipped into these triangle areas. I've just gone straight across them with my diagonals. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to pop in my axis. That's going to go straight down the middle. And I'm also gonna pop in a bendy axis across the width. And the reason for that bendy axis is because it's going to remind me that it scoops like a cup. So 
So we're going to go through a number of phases of our construction, starting with recreating the envelope around the whole flower. Um, then we're going to be finding the center and finding the points at which the petals sprout out. Uh, we'll then be using diagonal lines to create the approximate shape of the innermost petals. And then we'll be working our way towards the outside of the flower and putting those external petals on. So now I've got my uh, axis in across both ways. It's now time for me to transfer this design onto my page. Now remember that we are not being meticulous. I'm not even going to be using comparative measuring for this technique. I'm just going to be uh, using my observation as best as I can because accuracy is not the point of today's exercise. Today is more about being creative and expressive with our mark making. So I'm starting again with my diagonals. Sometimes I like to have a little practice of what the angle is first and then come back to my page. So there is my approximate poppy flower shape. And I can also pop that axis down the middle again. and across the center. Now, if you did want a little bit more accuracy, this is a great time to use some measuring techniques. Um, so you do not have to for this exercise. Um, but what I might do is just ask myself, oh, does this section look too big or too small? Um, for me, I'm thinking that it's looking potentially a little bit small. Um, so what I'm going to do is adjust my line. And I can also check that measurement if I want to. So I can say to myself, well, how many lengths of a pen, for example, go into that. There's my pen. I'm going to leave my finger there as a marker. Is it perfectly halfway? Oh, no, it's not. My axis is a little bit off. So I should find when I do it on mine, if I'm looking for the same thing that I've mapped out here, that it's a similar case. And yes, I am finding that that is matching. I can also try measuring the height. Should be a little bit taller in this top section. Let's see, is it? Yes, it is. Over here. Should be quite a lot taller in that top section, is it? Oh, yes, but maybe not enough. Let's take a look and see. I almost need an entire extra finger's length on top of there. Okay, that's looking around about correct. I can also measure these top sections here. Again, around about an extra finger's length. That's looking approximately correct. I might wanna bump it over just a little bit further. And if I was doing a portrait or any other sort of art making where I really wanted accuracy, I would be using comparative measuring for a really long time. I would not be just um, diving back into trying to use my eyesight to determine where things are going to go. All right, so the next step is for me to find where my center is and to map that in. And so I can have a practice over here if I need to as well. And now I have a better understanding of what it is that I'm going to need to do right here. Now I'm doing mine really quite dark. And the reason for that is because I want you to be able to see as well as you possibly can on the camera today. Um, but I would recommend when you do this for yourself at home that you keep it very, very light. And I can start to make 
that ring inside and I can see that I'm going to be able to see less of it on the bottom. So I'm taking that into account as well. And now I'm going to be finding where my petals are going to be branching off. All right, so now that I've got my base structure of my poppy in, I can start to find the centermost petals. Um, remembering again, normally we would mind about accuracy. Um, today, that's not the concern. So I'm just gonna use my diagonal lines to start to try and find the shapes that I'm looking for. And it's okay if the diagonal lines make it look a little bit strange to begin with, because I'm gonna come in and adjust them later on. So I often find starting with this big one up here, um, with the most kind of central petal that you can see at the center is really helpful because now I can start to build around it. And the other most central petal that I can see is going to be on top of all the other petals surrounding is this bottom central one here. All right, the next petals that I'm going to tackle are going to be this one over here. Again, the reason being because that is the one that I can see in the next layer underneath those top petals. And if I want more accuracy um, without having to measure for a more expressive drawing, what I can still pay attention to is the negative space. So that's this area in here that isn't petal. I can check that this area here is the, shape, is the same shape as the area that I can see over here. And I can flick my eyes back and forth and kind of play spot the difference to see if I need to adjust it any further. And I could see that I could put a line that goes the whole way across down here to help me out. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So again, I need to be checking this area, asking myself, am I happy with this area?
All right, and now I have the first layer of my petals mapped in that I'm going to need. Now I can start to do the next layer underneath. And wherever I can cut the corner and make a little triangle with my negative space for a petal to find its shape, I'm going to be trying to do that. All right, now at about this stage, we've got most of our petals in, but um, my construction lines are hiding a lot of the detail of the, uh, the edges of the petals. And now I'm really wanting to be able to go in and make sure that my petals are beautiful because when I do diagonal lines, oftentimes I end up with a flower or whatever it is that I'm drawing that might look a little bit too robotic. Um, so it's really important that I take my time now rather than leaving it like this and moving on to tidy it up a little bit. All right, so I've actually decided to swap to a brand new picture so I don't have any messy lines on there. And now I'm going to start getting rid of any construction lines I don't need and tidying up my design. And for this part, you may want to use your firm eraser instead because sometimes a kneadable eraser um, can be a little bit too malleable and squishy to really be able to press hard and get off any marks that you don't want. You'll see that mine has marks left over from uh, the fact that I've been pressing very hard for your visibility. Um, yours, hopefully, if you've done it nice and light, shouldn't have any marks like these. If it does though, don't worry, because we're going to be doing lots of expressive tonal work on this artwork in the end and erasure. Um, and so a lot of this we're going to be able to hide. All right, and the very first thing that I'm actually going to do is to come in and um, make sure that my center of my flower is looking nice and round. And now's probably a really great time to stand back and look from far away. And the moment you do, like me, I bet that you're going to find some little errors.
So you'll see here that in this instance, I'm using my eraser as a tool for correction. And that's often how we use our erasers. And then later on in the process, once we're happy with our final designs, that's when we're going to be using our eraser as something a little bit more than just a tool for corrections. Try, if you can, as you go, to think both about the shape of the pedal and also what the pedal's doing, how it might be turning in space. For example, I can see a little crinkle in the pedal here, and I'm thinking about how that crinkle is going to affect the shape and eventually also the tone of that, um, of that pedal, even though we're not quite up to tone yet. Even though we're not going for accuracy, we're still hoping for this to feel like a poppy. All right, so now is the time if there are any corrections that you need to make to make those corrections. Because once we put quite a lot of expressive tonal work on top of this, you're um, less likely to be able to do that so easily. So I can see a couple of little errors in here that I would like to correct. Often I will stop and squish my kneadable eraser into a shape that um, better serves me for the area that I'm currently working on. And I'm still thinking about the spaces in between. So what shape should this little triangle be in between this small bit of pedal right here and the pedal next to it. So now we're going to lightly shadow shape. Now, before we do that shadow shaping, it's really important to remember to round out any unwanted sharp edges. Um, we need to turn your diagonal lines into any curves where it might be needed. Otherwise, you'll end up with a very harsh looking flower. Then you can uh, place in approximate locations of the most significant shadows you can see. So we don't need every single um, tonal transition mapped, but we really do need the big ones that describe the character of this flower for today's activity. Okay, so now that we're at about this stage, a really great thing to do is just to stand back from your image, as always, make sure that there's no little imperfections that you would like to address. Um, and then when you're ready, we can get into the process of shadow shaping. Um, and so this is a process which is going to involve us um, really squinting our eyes. You're going to glare at it um, to make it blurry. And those areas where you see the absolute darkest dark shadows, we're going to start by mapping them in first. So as I'm squinting, I can definitely see very, very dark shadow all around this area here, underneath the fold of this petal. I can see that it's going to be very, very dark in here. I can also see some shadow under here. And so we're proceeding like this until we've got almost like a color by number of our darkest dark areas. And these, these shadows especially, I want to map in quite lightly. 
because I may well want to move them or I may well see extra highlights later on that I would like to lift out of them. I also know that majority of this whole petal is going to be in shadow. So I'm even though I know that the entirety will be dark, I'm still mapping in the darkest dark areas on that petal that I can see. And now you'll see that I'm starting to move into kind of the mid-tone. So those are all of the grays that fall in between uh, black and white on our tonal scale. If you're not sure what I mean by tonal scale, definitely go back and review our uh, smooth rendering video and our understanding um, shadows and highlights video as well. So I'm really focusing on the shadows which are essential to get the character of this poppy. Um, so even though accuracy isn't our goal, I don't want it to look like any old poppy. Um, I don't want it to look like this poppy's cousin. I want it to look as much like this specific poppy as I can make it look. Um, and that's why it's worth spending the time here in this shadow shaping stage. And we're always, always, when we're shadow shaping too, thinking about our negative and positive space and thinking about how the petals are actually turning in space. Then uh, for the next step, we're going to squint our eyes. So you're going to glare at that flower like it's done something wrong. Um, and we're going to do this so that we're just identifying the darkest areas. So if you squint at this flower, you'll see that the dark areas are centralized in the middle and also underneath this front petal, which sticks out towards us. Um, and now you can see that in this example of my drawing, I've started to map that in. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment as well on your own drawing. Um, and you'll notice that, again, there are inaccuracies on my flower. Um, remembering today that accuracy is not the point of the exercise. So be patient with yourself and be gentle with yourself. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, and you're starting with those darkest darks because when we start with the darkest darks um, and we're not afraid to make them as dark as they need to be, we'll be able to create that contrast. And then you can compare all of your mid-tones to that darkest point and ask yourself, well, how dark is this compared to my darkest dark? All right. And so you'll be left with something looking a little bit like this when you finish your shadow shaping process. And this is now when we can start to lay in our absolute darkest dark areas. So again, I'm squinting to remind myself and I'm going straight in wherever I can see black. And now you're not going to be shy. You're going to press really, really hard because contrast, um, as we know, the difference between the super black black and a super white white is oftentimes what makes things look um, three dimensional or um, just what makes things look really impactful. And we want this to be quite an impactful, expressive work. And I found a little shadow I've forgotten, that's okay. Um, you may find yourself going back into map things as you realize that you might have missed something. I'm finding as I go that there's one or two shadow shapes that weren't quite correct. And also if I accidentally put something in which is a bit harsh, you might see me pat, um, pat it with my finger just to lift off a little bit of the pigment. I can also at this stage um, come in with my eraser too if I do a mistake um, which requires a little bit more work. When I'm shading, I'm thinking about trying to do my uh, strokes of my piece of charcoal um, approximately in the direction of the, uh, the way the petal travels in space as well.
And in some cases, if there's something which is entirely in mid-tone, I might just actually shade over that entire area. And then I will use my eraser later on to, um, to lift back out any subtle highlights which might be in there that I may have lost. Now for step three, we're going to place in those midtones. So use your charcoal to lightly shade the gray or midtone areas. And remember to continue to squint your eyes um, if you wish to improve that accuracy. Uh, you may also need to use your eraser to make corrections and your finger or a piece of tissue to help you with smudging or blending. So that's what we're doing now. We're coming in and we're shading over these midtone areas. And I might already decide that I want to be a little bit expressive. So I'm not being too meticulous for this exercise. I'm being quite relaxed about seeing where these shadows are and, and placing them in. All right, so I've mapped in my mid-tones and I've also um, got all my dark darks now looking nice and deep. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm not going to touch them anymore. I may still find areas where I need to um, build more or lift more. Um, but what I'm going to stop and do now before I continue is I'm going to grab either your fingers or some tissue. Remember that your fingers have oils in them, which will make permanent marks. So if you're concerned about that, you may want to use some tissue instead. I'm going to use that now to smudge my midtones to make them soft wherever I might like them to be a little bit more soft. Remember that we can still at this stage use squinting as a tool. Now, don't be too concerned if you get um, some tonal work in areas where it shouldn't be, because remember that that's what our erasure is for, and we can always come back and lift back out. In fact, it really is going to be our erasure in the end, which is going to describe um, most of the texture and the detail in the petal. Now you will notice that um, using your tissue or your finger is going to somewhat lighten everything that you've put in. And that's okay because we can also come back in and build again with our, um, with our charcoal. But I can also do it deliberately. Did you see that here on this petal, I used my tissue to lift off the charcoal. Um, and so I'm erasing some of it. And so even with your tissue or your finger, you're engaging in a process of erasure. I can also see some patterning um, and wherever that patterning might be dark, I can pop in uh, a couple of little lines and things to suggest the creasing on the petals.
So I'm already starting to at times integrate maybe a little bit of scribble or any other expressive mark making techniques that might go quite nicely with my erasure. And remember, we want to really um, try and make it lovely, but we don't want to get too attached because as a part of erasure as a process, we know that some of this is actually going to uh, end up disappearing. Now we're going to have some fun. We're going to go crazy. So you can use your charcoal and your fingers or blending tools um, to add some character to this drawing. And you might like to try some of the following. Uh, you might like to drift outside of the boundaries of the flower. Um, you might like to cover a section of the petals with some expressive lines. And you might like to smudge or blur some boundaries, obscure a certain petal, or maybe abstract a particular area of your flower. And I'm going to be showing you um, some examples of of this now if we flip over to my drawing station. Okay, so now I have the midtones down. I'm fairly happy with those. Now I'm going to get a little bit brave and I'm going to start exiting the boundaries. I'm going to use my charcoal to now cover parts of the petals, to reveal new shadows and, and bits and pieces that might be happening behind the flower um, and to kind of continue to chip away at what it is that I can see. Um, and sometimes what it is that I can't see. I might um, make some choices as well that are just for fun, um, just to be expressive, even though I can't actually see um, those things in my, in my image. So I've decided I wanna make my petal edge here a little bit jagged. So I'm gonna start to conceal little bits and pieces of that. You might want to do some gestural lines like I am that kind of encircle the flower a little bit. And I'm just kind of feeling my way around the composition and I'm not taking it too seriously. I'm just having fun. All right, so, so far I've been, I've been adding away and that's all well and good, but it's time for me to be a little bit brave now with my erasure. Um, I think that I am going to uh, swipe the tip of this petal and bring it down this way. I also think I might obscure what's happening over here. So I'm bringing that down and I'm actually already now starting to erase with my finger. Given that I've already started to erase, now I may as well come in and start to use my kneadable and hard eraser to in certain areas um, begin lifting. And I can even use it to draw, I can make lines. Like I've decided I wanna lift some highlights in the background over here. I think I want some dappled highlights back over here as well. And I'm also going to try and obscure 
some of the edge of this petal right here. And while I'm in this stage, I can also start to lift um, any highlights that I can see need to be in the petal to describe extra texture or highlights I can see in real life. So I've ventured beyond the boundaries. I've started to erase some things that I don't want to be as clear. Um, but now let me also come and highlight some things which I do want to be clear using my eraser. And I'm gonna start with my kneadable eraser for that task. And then I'll come in with my hard eraser later on where I feel like I want the light to be lighter or the edge of an area which is light to be a little bit sharper. And I'm also adjusting with my, uh, with my charcoal as well. It kind of becomes a bit of a back and forth at this point in time between your eraser and your charcoal. I might even make up a few extra highlights as well, um, just to kind of get the, the level of interest and texture that I'm looking for. And also a reminder that we, we really want to keep anyone who might be vulnerable or have breathing problems at the forefront of our mind when we're using charcoal. So if you do get a buildup of that charcoal dust, take it over to the bin and shake it into the bin um, or shake it outside. Do not blow on that charcoal dust, please. Don't forget little reflective lights as well as you go. If you really want this to work well, don't forget about um, sharp and soft edges too. And so the very last step is going to be to lift out any highlights that you can observe on your flower that aren't bright enough right now. When we put in those midtones, we often accidentally cover some areas where there might be more subtle lights that we need to bring back. And you'll find that your kneadable eraser is likely to be the best tool to come and lift these subtle highlights. Um, and then you're going to use your eraser to lift off any tonal areas that you just want to lift off. Um, so we've We've lifted the ones which are necessary to create um, the feeling of our flower. 
And now we're just going to create some movement, some variety. We might create a little bit of abstraction and interest by um, kind of creating some pattern and some texture with that eraser within the boundaries of the flower and also externally in that background. And now I'm going back in. I'm happy with my, um, with my subtle highlights in my flower. Um, but now I really want to play. I've got a lot of the information I need in there now. Um, now I have a lot of freedom. So again, erasing sometimes with my uh, charcoal by covering bits of the flower. And then occasionally also erasing with my heart and my soft eraser. I may occasionally also decide to use my charcoal on its side. I want to expand this composition, maybe take it out towards the edges of the page that way. And I can do that with my charcoal on my side to make my life much easier. And I can also, as more of a final touch, get my heart eraser and I can go a little bit crazy. I can swoop to make some patterns. So this is where I want um, anything to be harsh. And I'm also coming in and scrubbing to soften in some places too. And I'm playing a game of adjusting relationships. So I want to create a sense of balance in my composition. And a couple of main points of interest. For me, I'm really thinking about trying to come out from the center of my flower to make these swirling patterns around it. And I can remove the reference picture now. I don't really need it necessarily anymore. Now that I'm just playing around. Be careful because your brain likes to find patterns. And so when we're trying to obscure things or to lift things out of shadow, it likes to repeat speckles and dots and splodges, which are the same shape. And in nature, it's not often that things um, are going to be exactly the same shape in that way. Now I can very carefully um, brush off any little bits of charcoal and eraser or tap it into a bin, as I suggested before. And then I could come in with my kneadable eraser, which isn't going to leave any um, little particles. And I could come in and I can lift off anything that I'm not happy with. And there you have it. That's one very expressive poppy flower. So here are some further activities now that we've finished our flower that you might like to have a go at. So you could try in your own time to use erasing um, uh, with sgraffito. So remember that that is scratching back and I would recommend oil pastel is a fantastic medium to give this a go. 
Um, and then you could try some erasure using uh, covering. So using a paper or gesso, select elements um, of a finished drawing to conceal. And we can see that Anthony Carhill again has done this here. He's had a drawing with all sorts of smudging and some interesting techniques to create texture. And now he's gone and he's partially concealed a part of this drawing with some acrylic paint. And that really leaves us wondering what might have been there originally. And again, just creates a sense of interest. Here are our image references for today. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, remember that our long-term goal is to try and invent a new way to erase, abstract or conceal in your art making. And in particular, maybe find a handful of these techniques, which might um, become a significant part of the character of your personal artistic practice. You can see here that in my um, electricity self-portrait from 2016 on the left, I've used a combination of scribble and creating some also scribble lines using my kneadable eraser um, and that's formed my style for this particular drawing uh, and also make sure if you do complete this activity and you're proud of the results to share with your classroom tutor and maybe also post it in the comments of this video and as always I'm wishing you happy art making